Barry Gibb was born on the Isle of Man. Just one Gibb? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like normally it's the Gibbs. No, Barry Gibb. A singular Gibb. Yes, one Gibb. Okay. So far. So far, just one Gibb. Okay. He was born on the Isle of Man in September of 1946. His dad, Hugh Gibb, was a drummer and band leader of the Huey Gibb Orchestra. Huh. Wonder where they got their name. <laughs> they often played a ballroom and packed the place out. But he didn't earn much money as a musician and worked as a bread delivery driver during the day. What a life. Yeah. Just sounds fun. drive bread around. On and your then, little English island. Yeah. <laughs> and then sell out ballrooms at night. As a child, Barry was badly scalded when he accidentally tipped over his mother's tea all over him. I did that one time. He went to the hospital where gangrene set in. Oh, that didn't happen to me. <laughs> I don't know the ending of that. That is all I have in the script. On the 22nd of December, 1949, Barry's twin brothers, Robin and Maurice, were born. So now there's more Gibbs. Soon after, the family moved to Manchester. They hoped that Manchester would offer better opportunities for work, but that wasn't really the case. The area was still recovering from World War II, and the family often struggled to make ends meet. Do you know what I bet they need, though? Bread. Bread. Yeah. <laughs> for most of this early period of their life, they had an interest in music. Neighbors would see them walking along, strumming on a tennis racket as Cute. if it were a guitar, Cute. and performing on a dock. Cute! But in Manchester in 1955, they took it a step farther and formed a skiffle group called the Rattlesnake after Barry got a guitar for Christmas. They were ma mostly playing cover songs of rock artists and played at a few different clubs around the Manchester area. There's a story that they started singing because they were booked to lip sync at a local cinema, which is something that, like... The cinema just let the kids do every week, like just a little fun thing for them to do. But on the way to the cinema, they dropped the record that they were supposed to lip sync to and broke it. Oh my God. So instead, they just sang live and they received such a positive response that they decided to pursue singing professionally. Well, yeah, of course they did. They're like, everyone's like, good job, kids. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no one's going to be like, oh, that was, that was awful. <laughs> that was you subpar. Like, you should have just canceled. Had <laughs> right. Like, everyone's going to be like, way to go, child. And they're going to be like, I am the single best musician in the history of the world. <laughs> That's what happens. However, Robin, who was one of the twins, was a bit of a troublemaker. He was a known pyromaniac and <laughs> got in trouble for lighting some billboards on fire. What? So the local police suggested that the family immigrate to Australia. They immigrated to Australia in 1958. Pretty soon after moving, the boy started to perform to earn some pocket money. Barry was also working selling sodas during races at a nearby speedway. He eventually convinced his brothers to join him and they were hired by the speedway owner to sing songs over the PA system to entertain the crowds in between races. That's so cute. It probably sounded terrible. I'm sure it did. Like PA systems, especially back then, probably weren't great. At this time, they started to call themselves the BGs after Barry's initials, which is just like not BG, it was just the initials BG. So they were the Bee Gees. By singing at the Speedway, they got the attention of a local radio DJ who also heard some of Barry's original songs and liked them. So soon after all of this started happening with the Speedway and the local DJ, Barry quit school and they started to take singing more seriously, performing at clubs and venues around Australia. They had a residency at a popular seaside resort and even started to appear on a few different local television shows. Eventually, they got the attention of an Australian star named Cole Joy. He... Or she, I honestly don't know. I, I was literally just about to say, like, that's also so androgynous. Like, yeah. that is, I, someone take that name right now. Like, <laughs> well, they helped the Bee Gees get a record deal in 1963. They released two or three singles a year, but Barry primarily wrote songs for other Australian artists. Barry said about this time, quote, I think we made about seven to 11 singles that all flopped in a row. So we really found out what failure was all about before we even started. In 1965, they had a minor hit with a song called Wine and Women. Well, that song convinced the record label to re let them record an actual album. This is definitely not disco, and they didn't have that signature falsetto that they'd become famous for eventually. Their first album was amazingly titled The Bee Gees Play and Sing 14 Barry Gibbs Songs. <laughs> that has little boys recorded this all over it. I don't I doubt they named it. It was probably the label. It was basically just a compilation album of the different singles that they had already released over the previous years. But their label was on the verge of dropping them because they had failed commercially. 
Oh, well, gee, maybe title their album better. <laughs> the brothers met an American named Nat Kempner, Kipner, who was the new A&R guy at a different record label. He eventually took over as the band's manager and negotiated their transfer to his new record label. The new label was small and independent, and most of the records were produced at the engineer's home studio. That engineer gave the Bee Gees almost unlimited access to that studio, which helped them to greatly improve their skills as recording artists. In September of 1966, they released a song called Sticks and Specks. When they released it, the family had already decided to move back to England. While on the boat back, they learned that the song had reached number one in Australia and was a smash hit. So Barry sent demo tapes to Brian Epstein. He was the famous manager of the Beatles, who were currently, at this time, the biggest band in the world. Uh, Brian gave the tapes to his partner, Robert Stigwood. Robert was wowed by the band's talent and songs and immediately set up an audition for them. Stigwood said that he loved their composing, adding, quote, I also loved their harmony singing. It was unique, the sound they made. I suppose it was a sound only brothers could make, end quote. This meeting led to a five-year contract with Polydor Records in the UK with a distribution deal in the US. When they recorded their first international album, Stigwood already had a robust marketing plan ready to go for it. Is it better than the Bee Gees sing songs that <laughs> Bee Gees wrote? <laughs> yes. One of the ways he did this was he sent their first single called New York Mining Disaster 1941. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was their first single. Oh my and god. And he sent that to radio stations in a blank sleeve with only the song title showing. So many stations Yeah, cuz you like people would be like what the is this? Like <laughs> Well, many stations thought it was a new Beatles song and started to play it in heavy rotation. The good for Which them. led to it climbing into the top 20 in the UK and the US. That's hilarious. Cuz especially if it's coming from Stigwood, who is Brian Epstein's partner, like and it sounds kind of like the Beatles, you're going to Assume it's a Beatles song and then it's everywhere. <laughs> and he, he didn't bother correcting him. Their next single, which was released with their name and no trickery, also climbed into the top 20. They were starting to establish themselves as a legitimate star artist. Their second album, released in 1967, largely repeated the success of their first album. It contained two singles that hit the top 10 in the UK, with one of them hitting number one. The album was a bit more of a rock sound than some of their previous work, and it also allowed them to tour the US for the first time. It was around this time that Barry sort of met John Lennon. He was at a nightclub with Pete Townsend, who is the leader of the band The Who. They were sharing a drink when Pete asked if Barry wanted to meet John Lennon. John was still wearing his costume from the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album cover shoot that they did earlier that day. That's amazing. So they walked up to him and Pete introduced Barry, to which John replied, how you doing, without turning around. <laughs> so Barry says, quote, I met John Lennon's back. I didn't meet his front, end quote. <laughs> they went on a series of international tours, which eventually led Barry and Robin to collapse from exhaustion on a flight to Turkey. Despite that, they kept touring throughout Europe, backed by a massive orchestra band. But by 1968, tensions were starting to get frayed in the group. Probably not helped by an exhausting schedule, the brothers were struggling with each other to determine the musical direction of the group. Barry was always seen as the de facto leader, which probably annoyed the twins. The tension could be seen in some of their performances and recordings. During the recording of their next album in 1969, which was a concept album, Robin left the group and started his own solo project. Typical Robin. <laughs> Barry and Maurice continued on and recruited their sister to sing with them. <laughs> Robin later said, quote, that was a period where we had tremendous egos for success, where we just stopped talking to each other. We had people saying that you're responsible for the success of the group and he's successful. So we all had our own sort of court, end quote. The next album without Robin was not successful. Robin's solo album was also not successful. In December of 1969, Maurice and Barry decided to part ways professionally, but that didn't last long. By August of 1970, Barry said, quote, Robin rang me in Spain where I was on holiday, saying, let's do it again. <laughs> so the three of them started to work together as the Bee Gees again after only like a few months. Of, like, you not just being need a, a break. Yeah. They released an album called Two Years On, which had a single hit number two in the U.S. after they promoted it on several different like TV shows. 
They released a few more albums and singles to moderate success in the early 70s, but by 1973, they were in a creative rut. At the suggestion of Eric Clapton, they moved to Miami in 1975 to work on their next album with an R&B producer. So they first started to work on ballads, but switched their focus to more rhythmic, disco-style songs that were popular, especially in Florida at the time. Some of the songs featured Barry's first attempt at falsetto singing in the background vocals. The group really liked the sound, and so did the public. The album shot up the charts, and the next album was drenched in Barry's falsetto and disco synthesizer sounds. In 1976 and 1977, they were approached for a project called Saturday Night Fever. At the beginning, the Bee Gees were not a part of the project, and the filmmakers used other songs, but they couldn't get the clearance to actually use those songs in the movie because the label wanted to pursue a different disco-themed project. That was kind of confusing. Did you track with that? So, like, they're doing another movie or show or something that is going to have, like, disco, and they're like, we want these songs for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, during post-production, they turned to the Bee Gees. Their manager, Stigwood, was heavily involved with the movie and asked them to be a part. Barry later said, quote, We were recording our new album in the north of France, and we'd written about and recorded about four or five songs for the new album when Stigwood rang from L.A. and said, We're putting together this little film, low budget, called Tribal Rights of a Saturday Night. Would you have any songs on hand? And we said, Look, we can't. We haven't any time to sit down and write for a film. We didn't know what it was about. End quote. The brothers eventually agreed and wrote and recorded the songs in basically one weekend. When Stigwood and the producers came to hear the songs, they flipped out and said they'd be perfect, but the Bee Gees had no real idea what the movie was even about. But they were in the process of finding a new sound. This was around 1975 or 1976 before they had really gone straight disco. They were struggling to get hits and their sound was played out. They had started to think that maybe their time as a band had run its course. So when Stigwood asked them to make the songs more disco, they just kind of went with it to see what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. They wrote a song called Saturday Night, but there was already there were already so many songs with that title, so they changed it to Stayin' Alive. That song would change their lives. They've had mixed feelings about the song over the years. They are proud of it and think it's a good song and it helped revitalize their careers, but it also cemented them in so many people's minds as only a disco bi- band, despite their long and varied career before that. Saturday Night Fever was a massive success, and three of their songs from it reached number one. The the soundtrack is still the second best-selling soundtrack of all time, behind The Bodyguard, which was a Whitney Houston movie-slash-soundtrack. It is the only disco album to ever win a Grammy for Album of the Year. It has been included in almost every greatest albums list that it can possibly be included in. It has since sold something like 40 million copies. It started a period of chart dominance by the Gibb Brothers. At one point, This is pretty crazy. At one point, five songs written by the brothers were in the top 10 at the same time. Wow. Making them the first band to do that since the Beatles. Wow. Thinking back on the success of Saturday Night Fever, Barry said, quote, Fever was number one every week. It wasn't just like a hit album. It was number one every single week for 25 weeks. Whoa. It was just an amazing, crazy, extraordinary time. I remember not being able to answer the phone, and I remember people climbing over my walls. I was quite grateful when it stopped. It was too unreal. In the long run, your life is better if it's not like that on a constant basis. Nice though it was. End quote. Their younger brother also started a solo career, like not in the band, brother. Started a solo career and his first three singles, produced by Barry, all hit number one. Why didn't they invite him? (laughs) They like got their sister in, which like great girl power, but like I think he was significantly younger, so they might have just not felt like he was ready at that uh, point. I don't know. Their follow up album to Saturday Night Fever also had three number one singles. Barry became the first writer to have four straight number one hits, which broke the Lennon McCartney record. Wow. <laughs> Anytime you can break a Beatles record is just like absurd. Yeah. However, they were completely tied to disco at this point, so their success rose and fell with disco. By 1979, the American public was sick of disco, and the backlash started. That's so sad. Four years. Yeah. They released an album in 1981 that failed to break the top 45, which was a tremendous failure after three years of unbelievable hits. They also all released solo albums that didn't do too well commercially. But the brothers kept finding success behind the scenes. They wrote and produced songs for star artists like Diana Ross and Barbra Streisand. In 1983, Barry worked with country artist Kenny Rogers on his new album that featured the song that Barry wrote for him called Islands in the Stream. 
Kenny recorded it with Dolly Parton, and it became one of the best-selling country singles of all time. In 1988, the Bee Gees planned on letting their younger brother Andy into the group. Finally! However, in March of 1988, Andy passed away. Oh my God. Of myocarditis. Oh my God. After a viral infection. Oh my God. He was only 30 years old. Damn. Yeah. Their album in 1989 featured a song dedicated to him called Wish You Were Here, which would be the Bee Gees' first top 10 single in over a decade. So aside from the musical struggles, the 80s were also a bit of a rough period for the boys personally. Robin had a highly contentious divorce from his wife. Their marriage went off the rails due to his addiction to amphetamines. That all sounds like Robin. The divorce proceedings took a nasty turn when Robin started to make threats against his wife's lawyers and sending them aggressive messages. A way to go, Robin. Okay. Insinuating that he'd hired a hitman to kill them. Okay. The lawyers reported the messages, and Robin was investigated by the FBI, but Good eventually God. his wife and her lawyers didn't press charges, so it was all dropped. The other twin, Maurice, was an alcoholic who was starting to have a little bit of health problems from his alcohol abuse. His alcoholism also ruined his brief marriage to pop star Lulu. His drinking came to a head in 1991 after a month-long bender when he threatened his wife, not Lulu, his second wife, and kid with a gun. I need these men to... <laughs> Just calm down. See, like this whole time I've been thinking, man, they really have just been like encouraged all of their life, yeah. but they're not like weird about it. Here's the weird. Yeah. So that wife fled to Barry's house and said she'd divorce him unless he got it under control. So he went to rehab. Maurice said he'd battled booze since the 70s when John Lennon introduced him to his favorite drink, a scotch and coke. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, quote, if John had given me cyanide, I would have drunk the cyanide. I was so in awe of the man, end quote. Also was, yeah, same. That's fair. <laughs> Maurice's desire to get sober also had a lot to do with Andy's death, their brother, yeah, and his failure to reach Andy before he died. It also prompted Barry and Robin to help him however they could. Maurice eventually got sober in the early 90s and would stay sober. Go, Maurice. Proud of you. Yeah. Please don't threaten people with guns throughout the 90s and you'll notice barry didn't have any problematic stuff during this time he's just what out. is barry doing i don't know throughout the 90s the band continued to write record perform and produce songs they worked on a few new songs for the broadway production of saturday night fever they also wrote for other artists they put out some singles and some albums but they weren't seeing the same success that they once had on December 31st, 1999, they closed out the millennium with what would be their final full-sized concert that they called BG2K. In 2001, they released what would turn out to be their final album of new material. It was a success, reaching the top 10 in the UK and the top 20 in the US. On June 12th, 2003, Maurice went to the hospital for emergency surgery on a twisted intestine. Mm. The issue in surgery caused him to go to, into cardiac arrest. Mm. He would die later that day at the age of 53. Damn. Robin, being Maurice's twin, probably struggled with his death more than anyone. He would say, quote, We were kids together and teenagers. We spent the whole of our lives with each other because of our music. I can't accept that he's dead. I just imagine he's alive somewhere else. For a time, Robin and Barry decided to stop the Bee Gees, but later picked it back up to honor Maurice's legacy. However, they'd only ever performed little one-off shows. The band was essentially broken up. Throughout the 2000s, the brothers had performed together periodically on a number of different shows, but mostly they work on their own solo stuff. In November of 2011, it was announced that Robin had been diagnosed with liver cancer. He would pass away in 2012 of liver and kidney failure after pneumonia put him into a coma. Robin and Barry had famously clashed over the course of their lives and careers. And at his funeral, Barry said, quote, Even right up to the end, we found conflict with each other which now means nothing. It just means nothing. If there's conflict in your lives, get rid of it, end quote. Since Robin's death, Barry has continued on with solo shows and pushing forward the legacy of the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees are a group that have probably spawned just as much ridicule as praise, but their legacy should be more widely appreciated. Yeah, overall, I'm a fan. They've been praised by the likes of Beyonce, The Who, John Lennon, Carrie Underwood. Their careers were so much more than the brief five years that they were a disco band but even if it wasn't that time was more than enough to cement them as legends the group are to date the most successful family and sibling band of all time they're the most successful musical trio of all time and the most successful musical act with ties to australia all right well that's the bgs